about 12 or 13 years ago, I, uh, I started to build something called the International Network of Street Papers. It was a bit older than that. And the International Network of Street Papers was based on the principle that there was no borders over homelessness. Wherever homelessness reared its ugly head, then we would go there. And we would use some of the money that we got, some of the profits that we made from selling papers and selling ads. And what was interesting, there was a bunch of people who were very liberal, who were very well-intentioned, who were very committed to homeless people. And the real problem was, they said, but we've got all the homeless we need. Why are we going to Africa? Why are we going to South Africa? Why are we going to Russia? Why are we going to Germany? Why are we going to France and Italy and all these other countries? Uh, we, we haven't solved the problem of homelessness here. And I said, look, when I was a boy, I was taught to hate people because my family brought me up as a Catholic, a particular weird form of Catholic where you couldn't like Jews and blacks and Indians and even English people because we were from Ireland. Um, and when you actually become an internationalist because... Uh, I got involved in revolutionary politics at the age of 21 in France at the time of the May and June days when we were frying stuff at the Garde Mobile and then the Garde Mobile were coming in and beating seven colours of shit out of us. Um, and I became an internationalist and now, what, 46 years later, 45 years later, I'm still an internationalist. But I still had to argue with people that if you are concerned about homelessness then I would suggest that it is without borders. There are no borders between us and poverty, or there should not be. Or there should not be any conceptual borders between us and poverty. Maybe there are borders, maybe there are all sorts of reasons why people disassociate a whole group of people. Uh, but when it comes to poverty, I would say that we're duty-bound to respond to poverty wherever it rears its ugly head. We put some money into the South African big issue uh, to get them going, uh, even though I had to put up with some nice, well-intentioned, liberal-minded people who said that, oh, no, 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 we should be spending this in Stratford or in Nottingham or somewhere like that. Anyway, so that was when I was asked to do this talk. I thought, you know, who recognizes the borders? In 1991... Uh, we did something to break down the borders that exist between the poor and ourselves. In 1991, I did something very dumb. What I said was that from my own experience as a person who was born into poverty, slum, uh, I always, when I go into a house now, I always count the toilets. And if I ever get the pleasure of coming to your house, I shall come in and the first thing I do is count the toilets. Not because I will need it immediately, but because toilets were always the first thing that, to that, that, that um, appeared in life as being very, very important. When you've been born into a slummy old house where there were 12 families for one toilet and it was on the floor above and all you could smell in the house was urine and excreta. So, when you've kind of gone through that kind of uh, beginnings, and then you get out, uh, and I was very, very fortunate because uh, even though I was homeless and in an orphanage, I was incredibly blessed by the fact that Her Majesty's detention centers and Her Majesty's prisons, every time I got nicked, I learned something new. So I learned to read and write when I was in a prison. I did all sorts of stuff like that. But what was interesting was that I made a steady progression out of poverty after the Second World War into the 60s, the swinging 60s, when the class system looked as though it was breaking down. And then I became a Marxist, Leninist, Engelist, Trotskyist, which, as you know, is a meltist. We were trying to melt capitalism. And then we moved on. I moved on, and I realized, of course, that the Marxism was great, but it was putting social change off to a period when uh, the revolution had happened and then we could sort everything all out. And I wanted to get my hands dirty now. So what happened then to me was I, I cleaned myself up. I stopped stealing and 
I was a devout, as I said, I, at one stage I was a devout shoplifter, devout Catholic shoplifter. Then I became a devout Marxist shoplifter. Uh, and when I got all that stuff sorted out, I became a businessman because no one would give me a job. And I learned to be a printer. I learned to design. I put magazines together for all sorts of people. And then when I got to the age of 45, I'd picked up all these skills. I'd been a beggar. I'd been in the prisons. I'd been a rough sleeper. I'd been a user of drugs. I'd been a pisshead. And I thought, where am, what am I going to do with all this? And also, I know how to run businesses, and I know how to bring social change by giving people opportunity. I have got to the age of 45, at an age when a lot of people are slowing down. But me, I've been speeding up ever since then. And I got to this age, and I thought, I know about poverty. I know about crime. I know about the relationship between poverty and crime. I'm from the underclass, and I don't mind using that term, even though a lot of people don't like using the term. I'm a person who wants to be useful, and all I've done so far is marry and have a few children and not actually be able to say that I'd achieved anything in my life. So I was absolutely driven by this idea that I could take the things that I'd learned. So at the age of 45, 21 years ago, we started The Big Issue. Now, what was interesting about starting The Big Issue was that there was a guy who also didn't recognize borders. It was a guy I met when I was hiding from the police at the age of 21 up in Edinburgh. I didn't, we became mates, I allowed him to buy me loads of drink. I was a very nice guy like that. And then what happened was I didn't see him for 20 years, and by that time he'd become a multi-millionaire. And as I've always said, if you ever want to bring any change in this world, you've got to have your principles. And the first principle is, if you ever meet anybody with money, stick to them. <laughs> Tell them exactly what they want to hear, because money is the means by which you can bring enormous social change. Everything done on a shoestring means that you often exhaust yourself in the labors of just making do, making do, making do. And what you really need is you need somebody to come along and say, here's a couple of hundred thousand pounds, now get on with it. So I always say, ingratiate yourself. Always tell people who've got money, oh, you're lovely. <laughs> Don't have a go at them. Only have a go at them when you've got the money. I'm now having a go at posh and rich people because I've got their money and I don't need it anymore. Well, no, we always need more. Anyway, and I met this guy 20 years later and he was a guy called Gordon Roddick. And Gordon Roddick was a guy who didn't recognize borders. He'd been in New York, he'd seen a street paper called Street News being sold by a guy just out of the penitentiary, talked to him and found out it was a guy who actually wanted to stay out of the penitentiary because the next time he went in, he would uh, be there for ever. They were going to throw the key away. So he went and he sold this paper called Street News. There were some problems with Street News. One of the problems was it was all about homelessness. And a lot of people don't want to open the page. <laughs> so there was this real problem that you needed a popular paper because you needed to sell loads of papers. So Gordon and I got together. Him and his wife, Anita Roddick, had started the body shop, so he had a shed load of money and therefore a great guy and a great poet and a great friend and <laughs> handsome, even though he had a big broken nose, which was bigger than mine. And he gave me the money to start, to take, to dismantle those borders. But immediately I ran into a problem. I had been someone who'd been a part of the problem, who was about to become a part of the solution. And that's great. There are unfortunately very few people who have come from the mire and the grief who ever get the chance of standing up and being leaders in the world. And one of the reasons for that is because when a lot of shitty stuff has been done to you and you've done it to yourself, you may spend the rest of your life getting over what was done to you and what you've added to. And I myself, I'm a 66-year-old geezer, don't go for a drink with me. I advise you, don't, because I might end up biting your ear off. 
because I still have my demons. But I'm a person who's coping with those demons. So therefore, what we need, in my opinion, is more and more people who have been a part of the problem becoming a part of the solution. So anyway, to cut a long story short, we started to work with homeless people and we kept running into the same problem. And that was that there was an enormous amount of homeless organizations. In London, when we first started, there were 501 homeless organizations. And within 10 years of the life of the big issue, there was 2,000. And all of them were little lights. There was no aggregation. There was no coming together of the energy. And I was always the person saying, well, why can't we come together? Why do we have to duplicate? And it was all to do with personality, because the people who start these organizations, they want to run it, they want to be the leader. But the biggest problem for me was that they were not including the poor themselves in this new world. What was happening was organizations were being set up by people who were fiercely, fiercely against poverty, fiercely against social injustice. But they looked upon the people in poverty almost as another species. Now, when I was a boy, I was in the underclass, the criminal classes, call it what you like, the underworking class. And then I graduated and I became a posh git, the posh chap that you see before you now, uh, and in the middle classes. There's only one cure for poverty, get out. There's a lot of people who spend a lot of time and a lot of money making the poor comfortable, but the best thing is to get an exit strategy out of poverty. And this is the big problem for me. So what was happening was that a lot of the organizations working with the poor were not getting the poor out of poverty, but in a sense, sympathizing and being sentimental and saying, oh, it's terrible. <laughs> and then going off and doing a PhD on it, on, on poverty. And what we needed was to mix our ranks with people who had problems, and may still have problems. I work with people who have severe problems, but I try and bring them into the ranks because I want the people who have been a part of the problem to become a part of the solution. I'm now moving to the next stage. I'm going to train my vendors to be distributors. And people are going to pre-order the paper, and it's going to be brought to your home, or to your office, or to your college. Because I'm cheesed off with this beautiful relation pe relationship people have with our homeless vendors. Great, they love them. But it arrests their development. The worst place on earth for a poor person is to have to work on the streets. But the point is, we have to find a way now of morphing them off. And we have to find a way of breaking the barriers between us and the poor. It is not enough to feel sorry for them. It's not enough to support them. It is enough to give them the way of getting out of it. Thank you very much. God bless.